Welcome. Um, this is the Built Green webinar for cost-effective energy credits for the me uh, for meeting Washington State Energy Code and Built Green. Um, I am Sonia Eau Claire, the Built Green Program Manager. Um, we will uh, first cover our basic housekeeping. We ask that if you have any burning questions, uh, please feel free to put them in the chat. Um, we will be monitoring them throughout the, the presentation. Um, but we will save most of the questions for the end. So if there's any sort of questions you want to get down or any clarifications needed, we will be monitoring them in case we want to interrupt the presentation with those clarification questions. Um, otherwise, we will have a Q&A session at the end. We are recording this session. You are muted with your videos turned off automatically. Um, and that is pretty much our housekeeping. If you need a refresher, it will also be posted in the chat. Um, and uh, Nina from the Built Green program will also be providing helpful links throughout if there are any relevant links to be had. So just as a quick refresher for anyone not familiar with what Built Green is, Built Green is a um, residential building certification program. It is a voluntary beyond code strategy certification program. And um, our certification program looks at a building in a holistic way, scoring based on seven different categories, energy being one of them, which is what we will be focused on today. Um, and our program and our checklists are all developed through public and private stakeholder engagement and technical advisory group consultations. One of the reasons um, Built Green is utilized by the building community and is one of the most predominantly used in Western Washington is due to the incentives that can be provided by certifying your buildings through Built Green. Some of those incentives um, include expedited permitting, FAR bonuses, height bonuses, reduced permit fees, as well as reduced parking requirements. You can find a list of these incentives available um, across the Puget Sound region at the builtgreen.net uh, built website um, where we list these available to be explored. Our handbooks and checklists are the go-to source for the information about our program. They, we provide free digital handbooks, which include resources and descriptions of all classes, uh, sorry, all credits, um, as well as the requirements for the different checklists we have. We have checklists for single family new construction, multifamily new construction, single family remodels, single family homes that are being retrofitted, uh, a communities checklist, as well as an Emerald Star um, which is a performance-based requirement that is applicable to any type of project. We also include um, supplemental guidelines for um, our energy requirements, recycling requirements, as well as wood certifications that are uh, applicable to credits. You can download all of these um, guidelines and handbooks and checklists at builtgreen.net. These will also provide any extra detail um, from what Sybil is presenting today. Um, we will be primarily focused on the Built Green Energy requirements for the single family um, checklist today. And we wanted to quickly go over what those requirements are. So this is in particular for any project permitted under the 2018 Washington State Energy Code or Seattle Energy Code, um, not, it is not applicable to any project permitted prior to that energy code. Um, so this would also be known as the 2021 Built Green Checklist. Um, and these are the energy requirement, performance requirements for the different star levels under the single family checklist. So as you can see, we have three different pathways that builders can utilize to demonstrate their energy efficiency on their project. Um, and they are then adapted to each of our star levels, which um, communicates the level of green or energy efficiency that they are achieving. So under the performance pathways, 
We have two options, which are a modeling-based option. One is the ERI or the energy rating index. The other is you can use the user-defined reference home performance pathway where you are showing a reduction of annual consumption based on those 2018 Washington State Energy Code user-defined reference homes. Um, the prescriptive pathway um, is basically that you are going to earn the code credits required and then a little more. So again, these are based on the 2018 energy code um, and you would consult the table in the energy code and look at the table R406.3 credits and you would earn your basic what you required by code and then these additional. So this is actually what we're going to focus on today is these, this prescriptive pathway. So for our three-star builders, you would need to achieve one credit above that code requirement dependent on your building size or type. Um, you are, for four-star, it's two additional credits and for five-star, it is three. If you would like to achieve Emerald Star, that is a required to be net zero energy on an annual basis. And you may also choose to achieve net zero energy label um, which is applicable to any star level, but does require net zero energy, and it does require modeling to actually comply with that label. Um, so with that, I will let Sybil take it away. Sybil um, is with Evergreen Certified. She is a senior project associate with them and um, a well-established built green verifier, and um, she will walk you through these prescriptive credit options. Awesome. Thank you for that, Sonia. Uh, let me share my screen. Uh, so as Sonia just mentioned, I am Civil Tribi. I work for Evergreen Certified. We are one of the built green verifiers located here in Seattle. And what I'm going to be talking to you about today is kind of some of the major changes that happened with the 2018 residential code. Um, I'll also touch on a couple items that didn't change between the 2015 and the 2018, but what we're going to spend the majority of today talking about is the additional credits that you need to obtain for code. Um, so to start us off, <clears throat> I wanted to talk about one thing that didn't change, and that is the thermal envelope values. So these are the prescriptive values that every residential project is required to hit. Um, so these should mostly be familiar. Um, window U factor should have a maximum of 0 0.30, as well as skylight U factors, a maximum of 0 0.50. Um, for ceiling insulation values, if you have a traditional gabled roof, you're required to hit a minimum of R49. Um, but if you have the ability to do the full <clears throat> uncompressed depth of the insulation above the top plate, your minimum R value for your ceiling would be an R38. So for exterior walls, you know, two by six wall, you're looking at R21 insulation in the cavities. And then for any floors above unconditioned space, such as crawl spaces or overhangs, you'd be looking at doing an R value of about 30. And then below grade walls is where it kind of gets a little bit interesting. Um, for below grade walls, there's, there's always been three options to how you could hit those insulation values. So the first one that you're seeing here is, um, <clears throat> Here is doing a full R10 continuous insulation on the exterior of your concrete wall. The next option here, this 15, is doing R15 continuous insulation on the interior of your concrete wall, so inside the building. So this would be continuous, non-segmented by framing. Or the third option that they allow you to do is this R21 interior. So this would be framing out you know, a two by six wall um, in front of your concrete and filling that cavity with R21 insulation. And then the last value that you see on here is this, the slab insulation R value. So this is doing R10, um, two feet along the perimeter of the um, entire slab. So R10 prescriptive is still a minimum, but we're gonna talk about some reasons why you would wanna do the full Lab R10. 
Okay. Um, so I wanted to show an example of something that, you know, I encourage to avoid getting into situations via good design. So good designs start with the architectural drawings. So this is a project that we were working on and we went out there to do our, our installation site visit. And we noticed that there was no insulation along this concrete wall, this below grade wall. So as I mentioned, you, you're supposed to hit one of the three options. So either framing out a two by six wall, doing continuous um, along this concrete wall or continuous on the outside. Just as a note, this project also did not have continuous on the outside. So what you're gonna end up having is this basically super cold spot right here behind the tub. That could potentially lead to, to issues like moisture uh, condensation. So keep in mind, you know, these below grade walls still need to be insulated and give it some forethought. All right. <clears throat> so a couple other things that didn't change within code. Um, I referenced all the different code numbers in my slides, and I, I believe these slides will be shared with everyone in this meeting afterwards. Um, so you're more than welcome to look it up and get some more details about it, since these are sort of uh, summary versions of all of them. So basically, for Windows, you're allowed to do an area weighted average U factor and solar heat gain to satisfy that minimum, that maximum U factor requirement of 0.30. Um, you're also allowed to do up to 15 square feet of glazed fenestrations per dwelling, um, exempt from that U factor. A lot of times I'll probably see this related more so to the door if you're doing a glass door. Um, this next one is about air leakage. So a lot of people have been coming up to me being like, hey, my, my building inspector is suddenly asking to see our blower door stickers. Like, is this a new, is this a new thing in code? Um, and blower door testing has actually been a part of the code for a really long time, I wanna say since at least the 2009 code, um, it's just slightly being enforced a little bit more these days uh, in anticipation for the changes in that 2018 code. So you're still required to do a blower door test. That maximum prescriptive value for blower door testing is five air changes per hour, unless you select um, a reduced air leakage credit, which we'll talk more about later. Um, and the only exemption is for additions. Right. And then lastly, if you have ducts and air handlers, there's also a leakage testing that is required for that duct work. So I'm not sure how many people are familiar with the sticker, but hopefully everyone in the chat has seen it before or some version of it. Um, this is the Residential Energy Compliance Certificate. And this is a sticker that should be on or near um, an electrical panel or a utility room. And it's supposed to highlight kind of different energy related aspects to the project. So the one that you're seeing right now is this 2015 version. They made some major modifications to the 2018 version, which I'll show on the next slide. But you can see it does list things like, you know, what is your blower door score? What are your duct leakage scores? Here are the different um, mechanical and HVAC systems in your house and, and you and our values for your windows and your walls. Um, so every new house should have this sticker. It's been in existence for a while and it will continue to be in existence. And here is the 2018 sticker. So um, I'm sure just by a quick glance, you can tell it is twice as long as it used to be. And it includes a lot more information. I just wanted to give everyone a heads up. This new sticker does take a lot of space. Um, so likely it'll be on the outside of the electrical panels. And just be aware that there's a lot of details that go into it. So, you know, as you're building out projects, you may want to just start jotting down notes to fill out this at the end of the project. <clears throat> and then um, a couple other things, again, that, that still held through from the 2015 code. So all hot water pipes should be insulated to a minimum of R3. Um, this is both inside and outside of the building. So within your conditioned space, um, these pipes should be wrapped individually, even if they are in an insulated wall. Um, obviously the only exemption would be where it penetrates through framing uh, where you're not able to get that insulation. So if, it, if you have a hot water line going through your framing, you would have that insulation budding up to both ends of that framing. Um, and then the last part of code that didn't change is if you have a um, fully electric resistance heated home, you're still required to have at least one ductless mini split, um, heating the primary space of the dwelling. 
And then just one super quick change that I did want to know is related to um, the efficacy of lighting and how you're lighting the house. So previously, you were only required to have 75% of lighting be high efficacy. Um, now you're required to have at least 90%. And now on to uh, the major change and probably why everyone is here today is to talk about the energy credits. Um, so I created this table to kind of highlight the, the trend of where the credits are going. Um, so as you can see here, this is the 15 code. These were the minimum credits that you were required to obtain based off of the size of the house. And this is the new 2018 code and the minimum number of credits that you're required to obtain. Um, so a couple notes that I wanna make about small units. So small units are less than 1500 square foot of conditioned floor area. And they also must have less than 300 square feet of fenestration. So if you have a small unit, a thousand square feet with 400 square foot of glazing, that automatically bumps you into the medium category, right? Which is a big deal because going from three credits to six credits is quite a large jump. Um, and then the medium category will be any units within that 1500 square feet to 5,000 square foot range and large is 5,000 square foot in greater. Um, <clears throat> There is also this R2 occupancy. Um, R2 occupancies are primarily, you know, small apartment buildings that fall under that residential code to so three stories or less. Um, there are different ways to kind of list townhouses as R2 occupancies, but there's a whole different <clears throat> world of things that kind of relate to that R2 occupancies within the mechanical code. Um, so be careful when you're trying to designate, you know, townhouses as R2. Um, I'd primarily reserve that as, you know, small apartment buildings for me personally. Um, and then the last category of housing type that needs to obtain credits is any addition, um, you know, less than or equal to 500 square feet. So that addition will need to hit specific credits as well. Uh, if your addition is greater than 500 square feet, then you automatically fall into that medium cap, small category. Sorry, so small, three credits. So um, one of the major change that didn't exist under this 2015 code is a fuel normalization credits table. Um, originally, all of the credits that you would have to obtain were the R406 table, R406.2 table. Now R406.2 is a fuel normalization credit and R406.3 is where you begin claiming, you know, the different items that you want to hit to meet your minimum point requirement. So fuel normalization um, is a new thing and it you, you kind of automatically get this credit depending on what your um, space heating equipment is going to be. The system type one, you can see is a combustion heating equipment. So think, you know, a traditional gas furnace. Um, would fall into this category. So system type one, you get no credit. You get no additional credits towards your um, minimum point total. They're not penalizing you for having gas in the house. They're just not kind of incentivizing you in the same way that they're incentivizing heat pumps. Um, so system type two is an initial heating system using a heat pump that meets federal standards. Um, we won't talk about what those federal standards are, but if you're thinking of doing a ductless mini split, you're pretty much gonna meet those standards um, as well as a, a ducted mini split system. So if your house is primarily heated um, with just heat pump technology, you have very little to no electric resistance heating, um, you get this bonus one credit. Okay. Um, system type three is for heating system based on electric resistance only. So electric resistance forced heat, or electric resistance zonal, so your, your space heaters. Here, they're penalizing you. So they're giving you a negative credit if you intend um, to heat your units this way. I would say the major category that this will affect is likely R2 occupancies, <clears throat> where you wanted to heat you know, your multifamily units with electric heaters. Um, so you'd be working at a deficit. You'd be starting at negative one, trying to get yourself to four and a half credits. Uh, system type four, 
uh, is for heating systems based on electric resistance with a ductless mini split. So this is basically doing your, the largest zone of your house um, with a ductless mini split and then electric resistance backup heaters in other parts of the house. So for this, you get a half credit. And then all other heating systems fall into category five. So I'm not entirely certain what would qualify as all other heating systems. Um, I've been thinking of this as, as kind of a hydronic, if you're going hydronic space heating. But again, like I said, I'm not entirely sure what falls into this. And I haven't been able to get any sort of clarification from people about what would fall into this category either. So now that we've talked about table R406.3, what I wanna do is start talking about table R406.2, um, point values associated with different credits and sort of highlight um, what these different credits and, and bring some clarity to what they mean. So rather than um, <clears throat> basically copying and pasting the table, I rewrote it out so it's a little bit more clear and it just really highlights the important parts of those credits. So. If you haven't seen it before, it's kind of broken up into a bunch of different category. Each category has its own title. So this is section one. And section one is related to um, everything envelope. So your insulation values, your window U factors, and then so forth. We'll, we'll kind of go through all the different sections. So in here, like I said, this section is related to um, insulation and windows. You're only allowed to pick one credit out of this section. And the point values for the credits are listed here. Um, R2 occupancies do get their own point values. Um, in this, this page here, it doesn't really impact much. There is this NA, so you get no credits for selecting 1.3. But on the other pages, some of these point values are actually worth more for R2 occupancy. So this first one here is doing windows that have basically a weighted U factor of 0.24. Um, so this could, depending on how big your windows are, be leading you into the route of triple pane or very efficient double pane. Um, the next 1.20, we're definitely looking at going triple pane windows here um, and then keeping all the rest of your prescriptive insulation values the same. That one would be worth one point. Um, 1 .3, uh, credit 1.3, I would say, is definitely the most popular option, the one that I see selected the most. So this would be decreasing your window um, U factor to 0.28 from what is originally 0.3, um, increasing your floor R value to R38. So your floors are above unconditioned space, crawl space, um, overhang, et cetera. So going from R30 to an R38. An R38 bat will still fit in a two by 12. And then the last change um, related to 1.3, is your slab insulation. So rather than just insulating your slab along that perimeter, you're looking at insulating the entire slab under conditioned space. So if you have a garage, you're still not required to insulate under that garage, but you would be required to insulate anywhere that is conditioned living space above that. Um, option 1.4 kind of plays along the same things as 1.3 because you're doing changes all across the building. So your windows are now going to 0.25 um, and then your floor is still at R38, but what they've done is they've added um, insulation properties to your walls. So your above grade walls, you're now looking at including R4 continuous insulation. So generally this would be done by insulating along the exterior of the building, but there are some other creative ways to hit that R4 um, you could do a layer of continuous um, inside of the building, inside of your framing. Um, you know, I'd be careful with that, I, going that route, just to make sure that you have the ability to still dry out one way or the other. So this would be something to really consider um, talking to your architects about, you know, making sure that you're still able to dry out your building. Um, or you could do, for instance, a double two by four wall and leave a gap within that two by four wall to insulate um, continuous along that. So I didn't list out 1.5 and 1.6 in this table because they're very similar to 1.4. All they do is simply um, decrease the window U values and increase the insulation values. Okay. And the last option in this table is 1.7. Um, so 1.7, you'd be looking at doing advanced framing. So 24 on center instead of 16 on center. 
Um, and then same thing, there's kind of certain requirements related to um, windows and insulation. Um, so moving on to section two, uh, section two is all about air leakage control and efficient ventilation. So reducing your blower door score um, while increasing or changing your ventilation strategies for a building. So um, the state of Washington recognizes three different ways to ventilate a house. There's supply only, which is primarily done with, um, think of a furnace, kind of bringing in air into the house. There's exhaust only, which is certainly the, the most common, the most popular option. So that's having your whole house exhaust fan, extracting air from the house. And the third option is balanced ventilation, um, which would be done via an HRV or an ERV. Uh, then we'll talk a little bit more about that in the next slide. But as you go through these credits, you'll notice they kind of start changing how you're doing ventilation. So the first credit 2.1, is going from a five ACH blower door score down to a three ACH blower door score and making sure that your whole house ventilation is high efficacy. So if you're doing whole house exhaust fan, you're getting uh, a rate of 0 0.35 watts per CFM, right? Um, then they also list um, how you would test R2 occupancy. So unlike a single family house, an R2 building would be tested the whole, the shell of the building um, rather than the volume of a unit. So that's those rates there, 0 0.3 CFM per square foot of envelope. Just a different way of testing, still a similar result, still a similar um, manner of running that test. Right. So credit 2.2 is reducing that air leakage to 2 ACH or 0.25 for an R2. And now we're looking at starting to add the HRV or the ERV for ventilation. And they have a sensible recovery efficiency. So it's just a matter of, of efficiency is how they're rated of 0 0.65. So this is a, a, a mid-grade um, HRV ERV unit. And 2.3, <clears throat> reducing that blower door score a little bit lower to one and a half or still 0.25 for R2, and then putting a slightly more efficient HRV or ERV, something with an SRE of 0.75. So we're now in definitely the higher, higher range. Um, you started limiting the number of equipment that you can select there. And then the last one is 2.4. So reducing the air leakage to 0 0.6 ACH, extremely difficult number to hit. Um, in my opinion, 0 0.6 ACH was the original number that Passive House used to use for their building. So this is really an airtight house. Um, for R2, you'd be getting a 0.15 CFM per square foot of shell. And then your HRV has to hit an SRE of 0.8. So you're really down to just, just a few equipment at that point and just a few different HRVs or ERVs. Um, so now what I wanted to do really quickly is just talk about what is an HRV or an ERV for the people that aren't familiar with it. Um, like I mentioned, it is a type of balanced ventilation that will supply fresh air to different parts of the house, like bedrooms or living rooms, and it'll extract stale air from areas where you want to exhaust air, like bathrooms or the laundry room. Um, but what it does differently is it as you're extracting all of the stale air, right, you're, you're basically exhausting hot air in the winter from your house that you probably wanna keep inside your house. So what the HRV is doing is it's taking that hot air and it's heating up this core so that when you're supplying fresh air to different parts of the house, you're heating up that fresh air. Um, and this is where that, that SRE factor starts to play in. It's, it's basically, how much of this heat is it able to exchange, right? So if it was 100%, right, your 72 degree air coming outside the house would be 72 degrees coming back in. So as you decrease efficiency, basically think of it as you're decreasing the temperature that your, your warm air is coming back in. But essentially that warm air is going to, you know, places where, where you wanna have fresh filtered outdoor air. This is a, a basic example of how, how they work. They are traditionally fully ducted systems, um, 
which would be the only way to supply air to the bedroom and extract air from the bathroom. So if you're considering picking one of those credits, keep in mind, you'll have a bunch of duct work. So this is when you wanna kind of start working with different trades more closely to understand where you're gonna run your duct work and how you're gonna do it within your structural elements. All right. <clears throat> so uh, section three is all about HVAC um, and which type of equipment you plan on using. Um, so like I said, you're not taking away gas from these. There's still definitely all these different, there's definitely different options for gas, uh, but there just happens to be more options for heat pumps. Okay? So 3.1 is doing an Energy Star gas or propane furnace or an Energy Star gas or propane boiler. Um, for that hydronic. So you get one point for doing those as long as you meet their specific um, AFUE percentages. Okay, 3.2 is an air source centrally ducted heat pump with a minimum HSPF of 9.5. Um, so HSPF is same as kind of the SRE, it's just how they measure efficiency. The higher the HSPF, the better that piece of equipment. So 9.5, you've got a pretty good range of options there, but you're looking at doing that system ducted. So kind of like I mentioned with that HRV or that ERV, you really want to coordinate with your trades about where you're going to run your duct work and how to do it most efficiently. Um, 3.2 is a closed loop of, an, of ground source heat pump or an open loop of water source heat pump. Um, in all my years of kind of working in the green building industry. I haven't seen a project do this yet. I would love to see it in person. So if you're considering it, reach out to me. I wanna come check it out. Um, and then 3.4, here's the credit for going with that ductless mini split in the primary heating space and doing backup electric resistance um, in other parts of the house. So this one has a specific HSPF of 10 to your, your not limiting yourself a great deal to which brand you use, but you do need to keep in mind that they are looking for you to hit specific um, HSPF efficiencies. So when you're working with your HVAC contractor, you know, make sure you list to them or tell them that you need to hit the specific HSPF. So for 3.4, you're just doing one ductless mini split and you can do electric resistance everywhere else that you'd like. So this credit is worth one and a half points, but kind of like we talked about earlier, you get that bonus point from that fuel normalization credit. So this one and a half just became worth two credits. If you're a small unit going to three, you're almost there, right? You just got to get one credit somewhere else. If you're a medium unit going to six, you still have a bit of a ways to go, right? Getting those extra four credits. Um, 3.5 is, a, again, an air source centrally ducted heat pump the same as 3.2, except for they have increased your HSPF to 11 from nine and a half. But you get this, this extra half credit for hitting that improved efficiency. And 3.6 um, <clears throat> is basically ductless mini split heat pump with no to very little electric resistance heating in the house. And again, you still have that specific HSPF. So you'll notice that a lot of these credits have this little A um, footnote next to it. And what that footnote allows you to do is up to a minimum, up to a maximum of 0.5 watts per square foot or 500 watts, whichever is greater of electric resistance heating in the unit. Right. So for 3.6, if you have a 2000 square foot house, you're allowed up to a half a watt per square foot. So that'd be a thousand watts of electric resistance that you can place somewhere throughout the house. All right, thousand watts is not a whole lot. It's not gonna get you very far. Um, so use it, use it wisely, All right? But again, this two credits paired with that fuel normalization credit, which was worth one point, this is worth three points. Right. And like I mentioned earlier, you know, some of the R2 credits are worth, have different values um, in this spreadsheet. So if you were going full 
you know, ductless mini split in your apartment building, this is worth three points, again, with that bonus point from that fuel normalization table. So Sybil, I just want to interrupt with a clarification sure. question from the last table you were looking at. Michael Laurie um, was asking, what about air to water heat pump or heat water in a radiant system? Is that applicable in this uh, these energy HVAC equipment options? You know, Michael, they were not considered at the time that these were being created um, just because they weren't very prevalent um, back then and probably still, still aren't today. So I'm not sure where those would fall um, into this category, but I imagine because it is air, um, it would still fall under one of these air source heat pump credits. Hopefully I answered the question. If not, let's circle back on that at the end of the presentation. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so section four is about um, HVAC distribution system. Um, bad news, this only applies to ducted heating equipment. So if you were going um, full ductless, you wouldn't be able to claim any of these. But if you were doing a furnace or essentially ducted heat pump, um, you can look at claiming some of these credits. Um, so the difference between 4.1 and 4.2, um, I won't get into all of the details about it, is where you're kind of placing your air handler. So 4.2 is looking at putting 100% uh, of your equipment, air handler, duct work, everything within that condition space versus 4.1 allows you to do some of your duct work within unconditioned space, um, mainly within the attic, deeply buried within insulation. But if you're using a ducted system, um, consider claiming some of these credits because it will help you a great deal in getting towards your point minimums. Okay. Um, so section five is all about water heating options. Um, so just domestic hot water and how you're, how you're heating that. Section five is the only section where you are allowed to claim two credits from there because they will allow you to pair credit 5.1 with any of the other um, 5.2 through 6 credits. Um, so 5.1 is installing a drain water heat recovery system to capture wastewater heat from all showers. Um, if you're not very familiar with that system, it's wrapping a copper, basically wrapping a copper pipe around your drain line so that you're preheating incoming cold city water sort of before it hits your hot water heater. Um, not a very common system in single family townhouse projects, probably would be a lot more popular, a lot more feasible to do um, in an apartment building. But if you're really down a half credit and you've got a great plumber who loves you, this could be an option to consider. Um, otherwise, I imagine you'll just select one of the credits from the rest of this category. So 5.2 is an Energy Star gas or propane water heater with a UEF of 0.8. So you get a half credit for that. UEF, just like HSPS, just like SRE, is just a way of rating the efficiencies of the water heaters. UEF is a value that is spans across both gas um, and um, heat pump and electric. So UEF is the same across all of those. Basically, they, they look at the efficiencies all the same way. So 5.3 slightly increases the efficiency of that gas or propane water heater to 0.91. Um, this would be sort of the, the higher efficiency. There's definitely models out there that go up to like 0.97. So you've got a good range of water heaters that you can select for from there. Or this credit also includes solar water heating um, and ground source heat pump water heating. Then 5.4 and 5.5 are within the same sort of realm of water heaters. These are electric heat pump water heaters that have the ability to go into the hybrid mode. So most of these have a backup electric coil within the tank, but then somehow they also have this heat pump attached to it that allows you to transfer um, that allows you to transfer 
heat from the air into the water in the same way that kind of your mini split works, right? It takes the heat from the air and transfers it. So this one just transfers it into the water. And Michael, maybe this is what you were talking about earlier. Um, so doing this basically heat pump for water heating. So in this, in these two credits, 5.4 and 5.5, there's the difference between them is a tier one and a tier three of NIA's advanced um, water heating specifications. So I have the resources at the end of this presentation that will kind of take you to um, this list of water heaters and you can look up whether it falls within that tier one or that tier three. Um, everything I recommend in terms of credit selection is gonna fall within that tier three because that is the majority of the water heaters that are out there in the market now, right? they fall within tier three. And the last credit related to water heating that I wasn't able to squeeze into that table before is doing an electric heat pump water heater that utilizes a separate outdoor compressor. So the other models, they're, they're kind of all in one unit. This one would have a separate compressor that you can locate outside the house in the same way that you would with your um, mini splits. And then the last few options available for selection is six, which is renewable um, renewable electricity options. So this would be generated via um, solar panels or um, wind. Yeah, or wind. And you can get up to three credits here, but each one credit is generating at least 1.2 kilowatts of energy. Right? So if you wanted to get the full three credits, you'd be generating 3.6 kilowatts of energy. Right? And then um, option seven is the last one. It's a new one that they added here. It's rewarding you for doing Energy Star appliances. So installing an Energy Star dishwasher, you're not required to provide a refrigerator, but if you do, that refrigerator must be Energy Star. Um, you are required to provide an Energy Star washing machine and also an Energy Star dryer that is ventless. Um, the ventless dryer, I think, is, is the portion of this credit that is somewhat deterring people from selecting it because in addition to providing that ventless dryer, you're also not allowed to have penetrations for the homeowner to later on change it to a vented dryer. So your plans cannot show venting on them. Ooh, so that takes us through the credits. Um, and now what I want to do is, is kind of talk about what Sonia mentioned is how do you hit your code credits, but also kind of double down to get the points required for built green. So she said earlier, right, that basically you would get two credits beyond what you're required to get for code to hit the point minimum. You'll notice in this table, I wrote built green and priority green. For people within the city of Seattle, there's a faster permitting program known as priority green. Um, that also requires you go the prescriptive route of getting two extra credits. So why not double down? Why not do both built green and priority green, get your permits a little bit faster and still just hit your prescriptive values here. Okay. So this table just shows you how those points change. And what I want to spend the rest of my time talking about is just showing you some different options about how you can hit um, code and then some additional credits that you can tack on to hit Bill Green. So I've broken down, you know, a few based off of the different unit categories, so small units, less than 1,500 square feet. You're required to hit three. My suggestion for these would be if you're doing electric space and gas water, We'll be going deckless mini splits with electric resistance. Then you get those two credits because you get the half credit from the fuel normalization. And then the one credit um, for that Energy Star high efficiency 0.91 gas water heater. And then if you wanted to hit prescriptive built green, you, know, you could look at tacking on credit 1.3, 2.2, and 7.1, and boom, you've got your five credits there. Again, these are just suggestions. You can pick any credit. You can go any route that you want to hit these different ones. I just thought I'd highlight um, just a few different options. So the next one that I have here is using um, electric space heating and electric water heating. So 
if you go with this route for code, right, you'll be at four credits. And you'll notice that for Built Green, I just added one credit because Built Green just wants you to hit that five, right? It doesn't matter if at code you were at four and a half, right? You would just add that extra half credit there. Um, so here we go, ductless mini splits with electric resistance heating, um, hitting that specific HSPF, and then putting that hybrid heat pump water heater, the one that meets the tier three gets you two points. So you're at four credits here. And then all you'd be looking at is, you know, slightly upgrading your insulation values for a half credit and then hitting that three ACH boiler door, right? We're still keeping our whole house exhaust fan. So we haven't transitioned into a fully ducted system at this point, um, which is great. You know, all your trades will like you for not putting in a bunch of duct work. Um, I guess what I, the last thing I wanted to say about small is because your code minimum of three is so much lower than medium, right? There's a whole variety of options available for small units. So if you're designing a house that is less than 1500 square feet, really pay attention to your glazing, right? Because you don't want to get bumped into that medium category. It makes it makes a whole world of difference. Um, so now to talk about medium, um, you'll notice I had some issues fitting in the, the tables onto my PowerPoint because it does get a whole lot longer, right? You're starting to pick credits from almost every category, not only to meet code, but then to add that prescriptive option for Bill Green and to get those two credits. Um, so in order to keep this Q&A longer, I'm kind of just gonna skim through these slides, let you kind of take a quick peek at it. Um, I know they'll share these with you, so you'll have them and you can always sort of message me if you want more detail. But here's gas space and electric water. Um, here is one for doing electric space and gas water heating. Um, here's another one for kind of going electric space and electric water. So this would be doing a ductless system here. I didn't want to put any ductwork in here. So I added, you know, doing solar PV to hit those eight credits. Um, and then here's another option for going with the ducted system. Figure if you're already doing ducts for your space heating, you might as well throw in a couple extra ducts for ventilation and not have to go with the PV system. Okay. Uh, and then I, I did a, a couple, you know, for the large units. I don't want to leave anybody out. So here is a way to hit nine credits doing um, electric space and electric water. And lastly, um, a couple of slides for the R2 occupancy. So electric space, gas, water. Definitely just gonna say this has been the, the primary way that people have been doing um, multifamily projects in the past. But this one does look at doing basically mini splits. It became extremely hard to go there with electric resistance heat. I'll still say it's not impossible. It just becomes more difficult but you are being pushed, if you are in the multifamily world, you are being pushed to going with mini splits in your unit. Um, so this one is doing the combination of ductless mini splits and electric resistance heaters. And this last one was doing um, full ductless mini splits in your apartment building with electric water heating. You'll notice that just picking your credits that you would pick for code, you get to that six and a half, right? So you, at that point, you have no extra credits that you need to get for Bill Green. You've kind of checked all your boxes at once. And then my last two slides um, are just useful websites, you know, some things that I used throughout this presentation. So I wanted to include that, that way everyone has those links. And that is all, folks. So we just had one uh, follow-up kind of um, tacked onto Michael Laurie's question earlier. Um, his question, he says, was about radiant space heat where the water in the radiant system is heated with an air to water heat pump, uh, basically an alternative to gas fired boiler that would typically heat the water. Okay, yeah. So Michael, that's um, a great question. And I actually have a project right now that wants to do that. Um, so I am trying to figure out which credits they could 
playing because I'm not entirely sure how that would factor in with that fuel normalization credit. Like, would they look at it as a, an other heating type and penalize you? Or would they look at it as, as a heat pump? So if you're willing to share your contact information, I can let you know how that kind of pencils out and what credits they're allowed to claim. Um, but unfortunately right now, I don't have that answer. Um, we don't have any more questions in the chat. So okay. if anyone has, we still have a lot of people on this call. Um, so if you would like to um, either open up your microphone and ask a question, you can raise your hand um, or you can put one in the chat and we can address it. We will stay on for a few more minutes. Um, we will take this time to also let everyone know we will be sharing this recording with a follow-up email. We will also include Sybil's slides in that email, as well as we would highly um, encourage you and ask you to fill out our post-education uh, survey. It helps inform us if this was useful and other sort of topics and delivery methods we can help instruct our, our industry with. So. I will stop there and leave the floor open for anyone who um, would like to ask a question. I take no questions to mean I did a great job explaining everything at a very rapid pace. So if you think of a question well, later on and kind of don't want to ask it right now. Um, I'll also have Sonia share my contact information. You're welcome to email me and we can chat some more about it. Well, Pam Warner um, did post something in the chat while you were talking, Sybil. So yeah. if the builder is going for the appliance credit after a dryer vent was accidentally cut, can they get the credit as long as they permanently seal it? Pam, that's a great question. And I have my, um, I have my, my, my diplomatic answer <laughs> all queued up. And I would say uh, the city is big on following what's in the plans, right? So if you had the vent shown in the plans and you had that credit selected, so I'm, I'm kind of going to go on. It's, it's, they should have called you out then. So I feel like if you cover it up, you would be good to go is, is my maybe not so diplomatic answer, but well, that would be my answer. Cause I've had other projects where, you know, they accidentally put something in the plans about um, something else that they kind of weren't intending to do. And the city was like, well, those are in your permitted plans. So now you have to do it. So if it was in your permitted plans and you showed that dryer vent, I think now you have to do it. So I'm going to bring Tom's question into the, the rest of this. Um, Greta did respond, but um, he asked if anyone is making ductless split syst systems that recess into the wall or ceiling um, or otherwise have a low profile. And Greta did kind of respond that there are ductless ceiling cadet units available. Um, but do you have any other like more information than that? Um, so I know the, the big brands all make one that recess into the ceiling. I've seen on projects, I've seen a Fujitsu one. They're, they're more of a square unit. Mitsubishi makes a long rectangular one, um, and Daikin also makes a, a square one, um, all of which do recess into the ceiling. I'm not sure how big the square ones are, like if you would be able to fit it into 2 by 12, 16 on center. But Mitsubishi does have one that fits in a, a two by 12, 16 on center within the floor. Um, they're pretty, they're pretty slick. They look, they look nice. I like them. But the big brands do all have some. Uh, Mark asks, are you seeing builders installing ventless dryers and are they any good? <laughs> um, I have seen a few ventless dryers on projects. Um, they did have the vent there so that if the homeowner chose to replace them, they could. Um, in an American market where people kind of want things dried as, as fast as possible, I'll say you, you may get some complaints because they do take longer, but 
ventless dryer are the probably the preferred technology in Europe and Europeans seem to be okay with it. So it might take longer, but they do work. And uh, just to let everybody know, um, Jess Harris posted a link about um, one of their, the city of Seattle's living building pilot projects. Uh, they used ventless dryers and he provided a link for that if you wanna check out their experience with them. Jess, would you weigh in on Pam's question? kind of put you on the spot. What you, which question did you want me to? Uh, I, I can read pay. it again. If oh. a builder is going for the appliance credit after a dryer oh. vent was accidentally cut, can they still get the credit if they permanently seal it? Oh, I am. <clears throat> Well, I think you accurately said that, you know, you have to, you're, they're supposed to be building per plan. So if it was on the plans, then it should be there. But it's, you know, it stuff happens in the field. It depends on the inspector that's there, whether they notice. I mean, so I don't have a, an answer much different than yours. So I think it depends. I mean, bottom line is you're supposed to build a per plan and you should be doing a plan revision if that's, what it takes. So. Thank you, Jeff. We have two minutes left. Last minute call for questions. I will um, end this meeting on time for everyone so we can either get a late lunch or move on to the next project on all our task lists. All right, thank you everyone. Um, we really appreciate you joining us today. And like I said, we'll, we'll follow up with a, a lot of you with the recording links, slides, and the post uh, webinar survey. Um, we do have some other events coming up. Please check out the Built Green um, events page for follow up. We have one coming up. Um, that is regarding and water efficiency rating systems that are a new performance pathway in the built green checklist. Um, we also have one coming up regarding um, embodied carbon calculators, which again are another um, big material credit available now in the new checklist. And um, Pam, what is behind me is my Lego city. So, um, and there's more, I just don't have enough shelves for it all. I'm working on it, but thanks for asking. Um, and those, and we also have a big workshop with Sam Rashkin um, in May that is now open for registration. It will be an eight hour long optimizing your design um, and, and your buildings with an active workshop where you will ha have a group of folks you know, working on real floor plans to provide consulting services that will lead to actual like tens of thousands of dollars worth of savings and even more value to your customers. So um, please join us for those events. Again, builtgreen.net um, is where you can find all those events. Thank you, everyone. Have a good afternoon. <laughs>